Well, good morning, church family. How are you? As you can see, I was at the men's retreat and I got a little sun uh, on my face. But the good news is, is you need to know that your pastor is a fierce warrior because when it came to the, uh, the little uh, uh, bow and arrow kind of dodgeball gang, uh, I and my team, we dominated, okay? You, you need to know that. Amen. Amen. Turn with me in your Bibles to Acts chapter 11. Acts chapter 11. We are going to continue our walk through uh, the book of Acts. Um, Also, I need to call your attention to, I want everyone to take out, in the pew racks in front of you, there is a response pad. There should be enough for everyone in the row. And I want you to pass those down. Everyone needs one of those because um, at the conclusion of today's service, I'm going to give you a few minutes to fill out that response section. I encourage you to take notes. You don't have to take notes, but uh, your your retention level goes up massively if you take notes from God's Word. But I'm going to give you three minutes at the conclusion of today's service, and we're just going to ask the question, after hearing God's Word, how does God want you to respond differently, right? Because we do not simply want to be hearers of God's word. We want to be doers. Amen? All right. You guys pray with me, then we'll get started. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning and and what a privilege it is to, to gather together as your people to sing your praises. You inhabit the praises of your people. You are here and you are moving amongst us. And right now, in Jesus' name, we, we pray that your spirit would teach us and convict us and equip us and move us forward as we want to walk worthy and be lights of you, King Jesus, to all around us. And God, we pause to praise you for the magnificent way that you are moving, that you are saving these baptisms and these testimonies. God, we praise you. Thank you, Jesus, that you would continue to save and draw all men and women, young and old, to yourself. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, I'm going to do something a little different uh, as we... uh, start the service uh, today. In fact, uh, it's something they specifically told me not to do in seminary. Do not have a long introduction, get right to the text. But I'm going to give you a long introduction. Hold your spot there in Acts chapter 11. And the reason is, is because I want to make a really important point out of the timeline of Paul's life, okay? Um, Because we're in this passage today, we're going to be reintroduced to Paul. He's gone away to Tarsus for eight to ten years. Now, if you are just joining us this morning, we are in the middle of Acts, and and I want you to pick back up in the storyline with us. This is something that you can just jump into. But what you need to know as you think about this is the Apostle Paul is going to be one of the most influential people in all of human history. Now, real quick, let's remember his backstory, that Paul was a Jew amongst Jews. He was a Pharisee. He was, uh, had special education. He was a rising star within Judaism. And he was completely opposed to the message of Jesus. Jesus did not look like the Messiah that he was expecting, and he was completely opposed. In fact, he persecuted with the fervor of a terrorist the early church. But one day he was on the road to Damascus. He had authority, papers to to take down Christians, to throw them in jail and to put them to death. And the risen Jesus appeared to him and radically changed his life. Immediately, as he went into Damascus, he he began to... uh, 
He began to preach and tell everyone that he had just met Jesus. But God soon called him away to Arabia for three years wanted him to reread his Bible, wanted him to work back through. How did he miss that Jesus was the Christ? I mean, if anyone knew the Old Testament, it was Paul, but he had completely missed it. And God pulled him aside for three years into obscurity, seemingly put on the shelf for three years. And then Paul returns to Damascus. But you know what? He only has a short stint of effective ministry when it's not too long before the Jews oppose him so much that they have gotten in cahoots with the governor and there are armed guards surrounding Damascus looking everywhere for Paul. He has to escape in the middle of the night lowered out of a basket in the most shameful way possible. Next, what does he do? Now that he's a fugitive, he goes back to Jerusalem where he longs to reconnect with all of those former relationships that he had. He was well known in Jerusalem, right? But he's only gonna be there weeks, maybe months before he's run out of town again. Jesus actually came to Paul in a vision when he was praying at the temple and told him, they will not listen to your testimony, get out. Paul doesn't understand. He argues with Jesus. He says, but they know me. But days later, he will be on a ship headed for Tarsus. Now, Think about this, because this is something absolutely remarkable. Because in that vision, Jesus tells him, they will not listen to you. I'm going to make you the apostle to the Gentiles. I'm sending you to the Gentiles. But if you were in charge of hiring, if you were looking through resumes for, for who would be the apostle to the Jews, Paul would be first on your list. Certainly not Peter, because he's simply a Galilean fisherman. Paul studied under Gamaliel. He's a Pharisee of Pharisees. He's widely known in Jerusalem. And yet Jesus says to him, I'm sending you to the Gentiles. And now Paul is going to spend the next eight to ten years in the background, out of the limelight, We actually know very little about Paul's time there in Tarsus. But we can piece together a sketch that goes something like this. Paul reconnected with his family and friends, his local synagogue. He told them of his salvation. He told them that Jesus was the Messiah. He he articulated from the scripture but they will ultimately reject him. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 tells us that five times Paul received 39 lashes by the hands of synagogue officials. It is probable that his family and friends completely reject him and even possible that he had a wife and she left him. Philippians 3, Paul writes that he has lost all all heritage, all identity outside of Jesus Christ. You see, the years are long for Paul and Tarsus, and they are filled with waiting. Now, here in a moment, Paul is going to burst back on the scene. Okay, He's going to become the focus for the rest of the book of Acts, Set apart for me Paul and Barnabas. Paul will write much of the New Testament. He will change the world. He will shoot out of there like a racehorse. And he is ready to run. But that's what's to come. You see, with that end in mind, you and I need to think about, what about the 13 years now since his conversion? Now, make no mistake about it. Paul has been active. 
active in his faith. He has not been sitting idly on his hands doing nothing. But God has been refining him, keeping him in the background, shaping his character, teaching him to walk in the spirit and not in his own strength. How do you think Paul felt during the waiting years? Benched, set aside, longing for purpose. How do you feel when you feel like you got to wait? You see, waiting exposes whether we are all about our plans or God's plans, right? Because when we dream, we're always the star of the play. If I'm writing the script, I'm the star. But are you willing to say, God, I trust your plans. In fact, you can use me however you see fit. Waiting also forces us to ask the question, do you really trust God? That God has not forsaken. This is not wasted time. He does want to use me and I trust him. Guys, how often we get discouraged and say, I guess I'm not good enough for God to use me. Or we get impulsive and we run and jump from one thing to the next, thinking we can force God's hand to move. You see, our instant gratification 30-second culture needs to hear this word. And you may be in a season of waiting right now. Friend, let me tell you, I've been there. My first 12 years in ministry felt like a whole lot of waiting. In the end, I would tell you this, God is faithful. His timing may seem slow, but it's perfect. Trials are unwanted, but they are necessary. Trust him, trust him, amen? All right, with that, let's jump into the text. Acts chapter 11, beginning in verse 19. Listen as I read 19 through 21. So then those who were scattered because of the persecution that occurred in connection with Stephen uh, made their way to Phoenicia and to Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except to Jews alone. But now there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who came to Antioch and began speaking to the Greeks also, preaching the Lord Jesus. And and the hand of the Lord was with them, and a large number believed and turned to the Lord. Antioch is the third largest city in the ancient world, third largest city in all of Rome. It is famous for chariot racing, and it is known for their deliberate pursuit of pleasure. Uh, They have the temple worship of Daphne, the city's most famous attraction, and it involved ritual prostitution. Antioch has actually become a phrase known throughout the whole of the Roman Empire for depraved morals. It was also a melting pot of cultures. Uh, One-seventh of all the city's population were Jewish, and they had their own neighborhoods. Now Luke here, he takes us back to Stephen's stoning and the persecution there in Jerusalem and how, how the gospel stayed in Jerusalem until that persecution kind of burst the bubble and then everyone spread out and, they, and it went all the way up to Antioch. Now for years, Christians who were Jewish, settled in those Jewish neighborhoods there in Antioch, and they would share their faith, but only to Jews. That's it. 
You see, culturally, they were very conservative, and they spent their entire lives only around other Jews. But not everyone. Remember many months ago, we talked about the Hellenistic Jews. See, the the Hellenistic Jews were those who had adopted to the Greek culture more. Uh, They were a little more liberal in their language and dress. Well, guess what happened when they got to Antioch? You see, they, they didn't even know any better, but they rubbed shoulders with and began to mingle with with Greeks. And you know what they did? They told them about Jesus. They didn't know they weren't supposed to. You see, liberalism at its extreme completely loses the reality of truth. But conservatism at its extreme completely loses the reality of people. But not this group of Hellenistic Jews. And slowly they begin to reach out to their community and build steam. And the scripture says the spirit of the Lord was with them. And suddenly, after 10 years of this in Antioch, revival breaks out. Revival broke out amongst the Gentiles. Verse 26 tells us that amazingly, it was in Antioch that the city um, became, uh, began to call them disciples of Christ. Here in Antioch, which is the city known for its sensuality and immorality, Christians first became known as Christians. Now, I know that doesn't initially register with, with you, uh, but what you need to understand is that this is not a title that's given by Christians themselves. Christians themselves called themselves disciples or the way. So it's not self-proclaimed, but rather that the disciples of Christ entered into Antioch and what the Spirit of God began to do there in Antioch was so potent, so powerful, that an onlooking culture had to look out and get a new word to describe what they began to see. These are Christ followers. And the Christ followers said, you know what, that's a good title. I'll take that. We are Christians. But think about this, because the culture there was full of materialism and spiritual darkness. But what they saw was so foreign, they said, give us a new word for that. Now, what a scene. What a scene, isn't that? Wouldn't it be amazing if the Spirit of God began to move so powerfully amongst us that our culture had to look on and say, we've got to give a new word for what God is doing amongst them. You know, I do want to tell you that God has been moving really powerfully amongst us, especially over the last uh, months. We've been praying intentionally uh, for salvations. Last Sunday in Easter, we baptized nine. This morning, we're baptizing six. We are following up with people who uh, who were saved over Easter last week. And at men's retreat, we had a young man come to faith. So I want you you to see uh, that God is, is moving, and, it, and it's in various backgrounds, okay? Young and old, male and female, various diverse backgrounds. I want you to watch this video of these testimonies of baptisms last week. Are you trusting in Jesus as your savior? Yes. And are you trusting in him alone for your salvation and nothing else? And are you trusting in his righteousness and his finished work on the cross for your salvation and nothing else? Yes. And is Jesus your king and are you gonna follow him all the days of your life? Absolutely. 
then it is my great privilege to get to baptize you, my sister. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, we're buried with Christ in baptism and raised to walk in newness of life. Church family, doesn't that light your fire? These are testimonies of lives changed. People who are declaring that they have been spiritually reborn by the Spirit of God. And and they are buried with Christ in his death, but they are raised to newness of life. I want to call attention right now. There is a card in the pew rack in front of you. It, It says, Faith response. And so we have preached the gospel many weeks upon end, and there may be some of you here this morning that you need to respond to what God is doing. You need to get baptized. Pull out that card. Check that box that says, I want to talk to someone about Jesus, about how to make him my Lord and Savior. I need to get baptized. In fact, we're going to be baptizing in the second service, six of them. And if you want to talk to Daniel, he will meet you right after the service and we will walk through and you can get baptized this morning. Amen? Amen. Okay. Why? Because, listen, God is near. God is near to us. He is near to us. Our sin separates us from him, but he has sent his son. He has sent his son to save and to redeem and to call to life. And he is doing that amongst us. I want you to think back. If if you've been a Christian for many years, I want you to think back to when you got saved, when you were baptized Okay, and, and, and you came into the newness of life, into reality of knowing him and walking with him. Our God is near. And that's what was taking place in Antioch, right? We, we read this in the Bible, but you got to understand, these are lives changed. The gospel is going into space that, that, that it had never gone before. All right, let's quickly move through this scene. So check this out. Uh, In verse 22, Jerusalem hears what had been taking place in Antioch, and they send Barnabas to go check it out. All right, now that Peter has had his his vision and meeting with Cornelius, uh, the Jerusalem church does not respond with contentment. Instead, they respond with encouragement, and they send Barnabas. All right, soon enough, we're going to have to do a character study on Barnabas. Okay, because this guy is filled with the Spirit of God, and he's such an encouragement. He's full of grace. And so you know what happens when Barnabas gets to Antioch? He found this young church, okay? And they were in need of discipleship, okay? Remember the culture they're coming out of, okay? Remember who it was that was coming to faith in Jesus, For the first time, it's not grounded Jews who grew up within this structured Judaism. No, no, no. Now it's it's Gentiles in mass. And Gentiles that have been saved from sin city. Picture the scene. Imagine, Imagine a revival breaks out in Las Vegas. This is what's happening here. Right? A city that prides itself on its debauchery. Now they have all these young Christians. And Barnabas gets there, and verse 23 tells us he goes and he gives them encouragement. Okay, with young Christians, it's raw, it's messy, but he looks at them in the face and he says, you know what? Christ saved you. Christ saved you right where you are. He didn't say, look, you guys are too messy to be part of a church. Get out of here. No, no, no. Christ meets you right where you are, and he gives them encouragement. Well, you know what happens after he gives them encouragement? It grew even more, okay? The church grew even more. And so now, 
Uh, Barnabas is, is burning the midnight oil. Okay, he's leading people to Christ. He's, he's having counseling sessions. He's, he's, he's teaching. He's discipling. He's doing everything he can. He is burning the midnight oil. And one night as he lays his head on his pillow, the Holy Spirit of God prompts him and he remembers Paul. He hasn't seen Paul in 10 years way back in Jerusalem. But he leaves Antioch and he goes to Tarsus. Can you imagine what that reunion was like? I mean, I, I don't know Paul's emotional state. Maybe he's a whipped puppy at this point, or maybe he's just charging and ready to go. But Barnabas comes to him and says, hey, there's a revival happening in Antioch and it's full of, would you believe it? A bunch of Gentiles, a bunch of Greeks are coming to faith in Jesus. Come on, I need your help to disciple. And Paul and Barnabas go back, okay? Paul steps out of obscurity and back into the foreground. And they will spend the next year teaching and discipling all of these young believers Hey, a few moments ago, we dreamed about what it would be like if, if God did a work amongst us that, that was so radical that, that the onlooking culture had to, had to give us a new name to describe what was going on. Beloved, I hope you're ready to lay down your personal preferences in order to meet people where they are. Because guess what? It's messy it's messy when, when you begin to, to get new believers, when people young and old are, are getting saved, because then you have to walk alongside them and disciple them. Now, I've said this before, but you need to hear me say it over and over and over again, that we as a church will do whatever it takes to reach and to disciple the next generation. That those who have the gospel must reach those who do not have the gospel. Amen? Are you ready for that? We're seeing it. We're seeing God move. We're seeing lots of salvations right now. Are you ready to walk alongside them and to disciple them? Now, in the final moments of our passage, verses 27 through 30, look, it says, now at this time, prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch, and, and one of them was named Agabus. He stood up and he began to indicate by the Spirit that there would certainly be a great famine all over the world. Now this took place in the reign of Claudius. And in the proportion that any of the disciples had means, each of them determined to send a contribution for the relief of the brethren living in in Judea. And this they did, sending it in charge of Barnabas and Saul to the elders. All right, you know what's absolutely amazing about this part? Here is a young, raw, right? Early Christians, newly discipled believers. They hear of a coming famine. Okay, imagine we're here, a prophet comes in, there's about to be a famine. They don't first think of themselves. Instead, they think, you know what? Because there's intense persecution in Jerusalem and in Judea, it's going to be really hard for them. And they start saving and giving a sizable collection to Barnabas and Paul to deliver for them, okay? So the first predominantly Gentile church begins sacrificing for their Jewish brothers that are 300 miles south whom they've never met. Is that radical? They jumped at the opportunity not just to receive the gospel, catch this, to participate. Later in Acts, we're gonna see a similar story about the Macedonian Christians, okay? Especially those in Thessalonica, okay? 
There was heavy persecution in that area in Macedonia. And, and the, the believers that came to faith, they were really poor. In fact, they were so poor that Paul, as he was going through taking up a Jerusalem offering, Paul, after Paul takes this offering, he actually realizes how good of a thing it is, and he will spend much of his missionary journeys taking up additional offerings and taking them back to Jerusalem. Okay, the Gentile church supporting those persecuted Jews in Jerusalem, okay? But Paul is going through Thessalonica. They're so poor, and they've been through such heavy persecution that Paul decides, I'm not even gonna mention the offering, right? I'm not gonna ask them. You know what? The Macedonians found out about the offering, and they found out that Paul didn't ask them. You know what they do? They go and confront Paul. They say to Paul, we get to participate. You don't get to tell us that we don't get to participate. We get to. And we are actually told in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 that they gave beyond their ability. They gave in and out of their own poverty. It's a magnificent. Oh my goodness, guys. I pray that you and I would have such a passion Okay, that we would know that we get to participate in the gospel. Okay, we get to get in the game. That God has given us giftings and opportunity and resources, and, and you get to participate. If I told you, you guys, your job is to sit and to soak. You sit on your hands and you listen to me teach every week and you don't do a darn thing with it, all right? You just sit there. Your reply should be, you're out of here, buddy. <laughs> Why? Because we get to participate. In the gospel, it's the greatest thing. We are the body, members of Christ. His arms, his legs, his, all of those things, right? You can't tell me. The spirit of God resides in me. He's given me a ministry, a passion, a purpose. I get to. You don't dare tell me I don't get to participate in the gospel. It's magnificent. You also need to know about our priorities as a church, right? Did you know that over the last 15 months, you, as a congregation, have given more than $800,000 to missions? $800,000 to missions. We have mission partners all over the world. Okay, in fact, one of our most exciting mission partners is here this morning, Pastor Apollo from Christway Church in Kampala, Uganda. Okay, he planted that church seven years ago, and in a metropolitan, you can clap for him, he's right there, he's going to come up in a minute. Hey, he's going to come up in a minute, and, and he's going to give us a, a quick update. You're going to hear from him, and, and we're going to pray over him. He, he's planted a church that's reaching young professionals and, and, and leaders there in Kampala, and we get to partner with them, right? You also may not know that Chad, did you know that Chad is with a team right now that they're in Chiapas, Mexico, in the remote mountains, okay, in very hard to reach spots because uh, one of the last remaining unreached people groups here in the Americas is there. And they are praying about whether we as a church should, should be used by God to, to be active in pursuing this unreached people group, okay? Isn't this amazing? that we get to. We're the ones who get to go. We're the ones who get to spend our lives and our resources, our one life, before we face the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And we have the good news, and God has blessed us 
with the resources to go. How magnificent. How magnificent. So now with those response pads, I want you to take those out. I'm gonna give you two minutes, three minutes, and I want you to begin to ask yourself, right, in response to God's word, with the encouragement of God's word this morning, what are you called to do to be obedient? Can I remind you God is near? He is near. He is saving. You may be in a season of waiting and you need to write, God, I trust you. God, I trust you. As you continue to fill those out, let me just speak to you here. The praise team's gonna come and lead us in a final song and it's, it's an opportunity for you to verbally respond. Okay, I want you to take really seriously our, our response. Maybe you wrote out a prayer of just saying, you know what, God, I, I trust you. In the waiting, I trust you. Or maybe the Lord prodded you this morning about getting involved, not sitting, but, but saying, I get to participate in the gospel. Maybe you're here this morning and you, you saw those baptism testimonies and, and you're like, you know what? I need to get saved. I need to talk to someone. We'll have ministers down here at the front who would love to pray with you. If you came in with a heavy burden of prayer, Please allow us to share that burden with you. Do not leave here feeling alone or as if you're carrying that burden alone. For, for everything we do here, guys, we're, we're just a family. We're a family of sinners saved by grace who want to walk arm in arm with each other, care for each other. And so your burdens are not yours alone. Allow us to carry those with you. So however the Spirit has prompted you this morning, I want to encourage you to be obedient and to respond to Him.